Hi again, everybody. Welcome into an all new edition of No Holding Back. It's a hockey edition this time around. Fred Pletch with me on our hockey editions on the bottom. Freddie, how are you? I'm surviving. I'm surviving. Still got the uh, the playoff beard going, looking good. Yeah. The, Guy uh, Godowski, head coach of Penn State, upper left, has been kind enough to join us. Coach, how are you? Doing fine. Thanks for having me. Right on. It's great to have you with us. And uh, I'm going to let Fred start. We'll uh, we'll fire away and, uh, you know, see what kind of things we can uncover here and have some fun. Freddie. Well, uh, glad you could join us, Guy. And uh, I want to start with uh, – and we start with everyone's kind of hockey roots. So you're from Edmonton and, uh, you know, kind of your, your formative hockey years. The Oilers were building that dynasty. And, you know, you were playing probably your Bannons and Midgets and, and your juniors. Yeah. Yeah. That's when, when things really heated up with that dynasty, winning their first cup, I think, in, in 85. Uh, tell us about that, Ron, and what you remember. Oh, I remember so much about it for the city. I mean, it was just every got, everybody got behind it. And actually, I don't know if I ever told you this before, but um, Ted Green's son was a, a good friend of mine, went to school with us and played with, in midget hockey. So I was fortunate enough to sometimes go in the locker room and and get a feel for what was going on and how things worked a little bit. And uh, I tell you what, it was just a, a really fun atmosphere that they had. And not only how they just did things in the locker room, but obviously on the ice, it sure it, it transferred over the ice. I mean, it just looked like so much fun. And obviously they just scored at an unbe unbefore never seen rate. And it was just great to be a part of that as a city. And at the time, you know, the Edmonton Eskimos were winning great cups and we had a triple A baseball team that won it. And uh, we had a, an M MLS soccer team, the Drillers won it. So it was like the city of champions. Everybody in Edmonton was having a great time, but certainly no more fun than at, at the time was the Edmonton Coliseum. Yeah, I think you mentioned that before, the, the connection with Ted Green. And yeah. uh, you said he's just a, just a, a wonderful man uh, to do growing up. Yeah, I mean, he was as all the, all the stories you hear about him, you know, on the ice were transferred a little bit over. He was an extremely caring man, but... I guess the one story that's pretty funny is uh, he took us golfing once and uh, we went to go get a hot dog at the turn and the, and the group behind us passed us. So we we're getting a hot dog. They went to the test tee box and they started tee box and they started to tee off. And as you can imagine with Teddy, that just didn't quite sit too well. So he went up and said, Hey, Hey, hey this isn't happening. Got no words with it a little bit. And finally the guy goes, uh, you know, the guy's team off. He goes, Hey, I'm going to take that seven iron and shut it, shove it right up here. And uh, Teddy just looked at him and goes, you're under clubbing yourself. And the guy <laughs> said, and then, and then he just moved him aside. We went on and teed off. So that, that was Teddy. Wow. Wow. So uh, give us the, uh, the route that gets you from Edmonton to Colorado Springs to play for the Tigers. Yeah, well, at that time, I mean, there wasn't an internet, and you really didn't look it up, and it was all basically word of mouth. Then we had a guy, you remember Gord Whitaker, by any chance? He was a Winnipeg Jets draft choice. He's a big guy, and uh, he was known as a, as a really good player, obviously, and a really good student, and he went to Colorado College. So um, I knew that, and so when CC came and recruited me, and it was Ron Byrne that came over to our house one day, um, you know, we were sort of, it sounded great. Um, and we knew Gord Whitaker went there, and we we're like, "Hey, if it's good enough for Gord, we're we're thrilled." And and that's how it happened. Wow. And then, uh, what about the, the the level of play going to college and and the WCHA at that time? Uh, tell us about the league then. Well, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, way higher level than I've ever seen before, played before. Sorry, and um, I mean, I remember going into. Minnesota and Wisconsin and just looking around and how loud it is and, and you have great players at that time there was Corey Millen and Brett Hull and uh, just great players that were just dominant and Tony Granato and um, it was fun and it was it was great I, I mean I really didn't know a lot about college hockey because there weren't games on TV or internet like there is now um, but I remember just going wow this is fantastic like I just love this I just fell in love with college hockey. Now, now almost, Ben, as you know, going from college to the minor pros can almost be a step down. When, yeah. when you from from CC to, to riding the buses, was it like that? Or you're just, hey, I'm playing pro hockey. They're giving me a few bucks to play. Uh, life is grand. Yeah, I mean, you know what? For me, I actually wanted to see a bit of the world. And I went to Sweden, right? I was fortunate enough. Our captain, 
when I was a freshman at Colorado College was Danny Brennan, who now works for USA Hockey in Colorado Springs. And he went to Sweden after he graduated. And I thought that was just a great way to go. And he sort of set me up. He, he allowed, he, he set it up so I was able to go to Sweden. I did that for two years. And, and man, I just, it was such a great experience. I just loved playing so much that I, I said, you know what, I want to give this a, a shot. I was a little bit of a smaller guy in college and had to grow a little bit. And so um, I decided to come back and like try out for some free agent camps and, and ended up uh, just really wanting to give it a shot in North America and ended up playing in the eye in, in San Diego. And then, uh, and then, as you said, back to the East coast league and riding the buses a little bit, but I tell you what, at that time, I mean, I would just do anything to play hockey and that's, that's what we did. And I actually loved the experience and, you know, you hear all the, all the, all the war stories of the past were true. And, and uh, at the time were a little, a little tough, but uh, really glad I was able to go through it. And I think better off for it. Guy, I, uh, I had the chance to meet Mike Van Ryan before he got to Michigan. I remember going and doing a story on him. He was playing roller hockey. I know you've got a little bit of background in roller. Uh, yeah. What can you share? Uh, what, what stands out from those days when oh, you were involved in that? Loved it. Loved it. I mean, unbelievably great time. As a, as a player played for Roy Sommer, who's now one of the coaches of the San Jose Sharks, and the longest – Longest tenured winningest coach in the American Hockey League, actually, was Roy Sommer. So uh, it was just so much fun. And part of it was, though, is because back then when it was all new, we, had, we couldn't figure out how to stop the sweat from going through your skates. <laughs> so when, they, when the sweat got on the wheels, you couldn't play anymore. It was over. So we'd practice at about 9 in the morning. And if we worked hard for about 25 minutes, everybody started sweating. Sweat got on the wheels and practice was over. So we went to the beach the rest of the day. So that's partly why it was so good. But we had, I mean, really good players and, and played in some great buildings, NHL buildings. And, and the fans loved it. And it was a lot of fun. And then I got a chance to coach it. And I think that was the, that was the fun part because there's no one to tell you what to do. Like now we all have a network of – of great coaches that have done it, been there and done that. If you really have a problem, you can't figure out, you just call one of those guys, they figure it out for you. But in roller hockey, it was all new. There was no one to call. So you actually had to figure things out for yourself. And I thought that was a great learning experience. Did you happen to cross paths at all with Brett Larson, the St. Cloud State coach? I believe yeah. Brett played some. Yeah, I know he played. I, I wanted, I think he played for Minnesota. Uh, I think I also, when I coached in the West Coast Hockey League, he was playing for San Diego at the time as well. So I think our paths crossed both both on the ice and on the court. Last thing I'll ask you about that. What, what were the rules like? Were they just like hockey? Were there guys dropping mitts? Were there, was, it, was it the same? Oh, yeah. Well, I remember, you know, when I play, I mean, there was guys, Link Gates was, uh, was playing for another team. So, yeah, you, you were dropping gloves. You were aware of him. I'll tell you that. Yeah. I mean, you look at Fred with his, he, he mentioned his Greg Spenrath Viking uh, uh, quarantine beard. Looks fantastic. We've got Spenner on our team. And Sasha Lakovic, who you'll remember, I'm sure Fred knows. I think he played Mihailovic in, in Miracle and was a tough guy in the NHL. I mean, yeah, there were some tough kids. It was, it was fun. I mean, it was, there, were, there was fights. It was four on four, and it was wide open, and there weren't really even offside rules were different. So it was back and forth. I mean, started out, games were like, 17 to 15 stuff like that and then once once they started figuring out they pay the coaches a little more towards wins then coaching got involved and, and goals dropped dramatically but at the start it was wide open tough hockey awesome well uh ben you know that not many pro hockey players uh go out on top after a 50 goal season <laughs> that's exactly what uh a guy did checking the stats here with the Fresno Falcons in 95, 96, 52 goals in 51 games. I know I've asked you about this before, guy, and you said your your body, your shoulders told you. It, it was, <laughs> so, so give us that transition from playing to, to coaching. Obviously, you had shown leadership and, and coaching ability qualities. Well, the reason I went there is John Oliver at the time was the general manager, head coach. And he said that he really had a lot to do with starting the league, starting everything up, and he, and he needed help coaching. I said that was my goal, to, to, to get into coaching. And so I was going to be a player, a coach, along with Steve Bogievis, who was a great roller hockey player in his own right. And anyway, got a chance to do that. And, um, you know, the season went well. Obviously, it was, it was good. I think. Um, I've been asked the question because I won the MVP of the league and, and he asked what that meant. I said, well, actually the biggest, the biggest accolade was I had to learn how to do immigration uh, for the league. This was all new. And so I remember our general manager, John, threw me a binder about this thick 
and said, hey, you got to learn how to do this immigration. We got to get this in. And I, and I, so I studied it all weekend. And I remember I, you know, at that time it wasn't computers. It was all on a typewriter with white out and, and got it in. And I think uh, he said, hey, you got your immigration. And actually, we're the only team to get it right. So congrats. So to me, that was my big, that was my biggest accolade of the year. So that's what I remember about that year. Wow. So uh, Fresno to Fairbanks, uh, quite, quite the move. How did that transpire? You know, uh, Stu McGregor, uh, who uh, a long time uh, scouted the Edmonton Oilers and did a great job. I think his general manager of Kamloops Blazers in the, in the WHL. He, he, he gave me a call one day and he said, you know, there's an opening up in Fairbanks. He goes, I know you love college hockey, you're a college hockey guy. And, you know, you might want to consider, take a look at it. And, uh, and he's the one that brought it up to me. And, and so I applied. And, um, you know, interesting, I didn't have any college experience. I probably should not have gotten the job. I know there's some really good coaches that were offered the job that turned it down, which is probably the biggest reason why I was able to get it. But when I got there, especially Tavis McMillan was uh, – was who you know, Tavis. I mean, he yep. he's a great coach now with, with with Denver University and did a great job for for the Winnipeg Jets and um, uh, in, in the NHL as a scout. But but he was there already, and he was such a good guy and so knowledgeable. He he really taught me a ton about college hockey in, in a short time, and we had a lot of fun. And uh, the program, everybody in the community, really, the timing was great. They really wanted to get behind the hockey team and. Um, that didn't have a lot of success at all in the CCHA, but when we arrived, they were just hungry to support it, and and boy, did they ever support it! And it was a lot of fun, and the whole town knew exactly who the players were and when we were playing, and there were sellouts, and it was really, really fun time, and we had success, and that was great college hockey. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, you you, you built that success uh, in Fairbanks and the Nanooks. I remember how what a big deal it was not just for the team or the campus but the whole town yeah. when yeah. Fairbanks got to Joe Lewis Arena to play That's in right. the NCAA championship like before that it was kind of like a pipe dream wasn't it for that? It, it was it never happened before and really people didn't mm -hmm. think it would and uh, I remember we we had a we had a three-game series against Ferris State to get to the Joe and uh, those games were when we when you talk about whiteout, this was a white that was everybody was dressed head to toe in white. I remember even the uh, the provost of the university who had a white beard also was was completely in white, head to toe in his beard. It was amazing, but everybody was. And I remember getting to the ring something like three hours before the game, and there was always already hundreds of people lined up in Fairbanks. You know, it's not it's not a balmy sun, sunny weather. They were lined up, you know, in this in the snow. It's snowing and all white hours before and uh it was an amazing atmosphere and uh to get to the joe was something that the whole town just really really got behind it was a ton of fun they they do call it the last frontier for for many good reasons and I remember we had an intern at the ccha uh stewart who wound up uh, getting a job at the carlson center and stewart said one of his game night duties was to go around and get the the open carry pistols and, and guns from people. <laughs> open carry state, but in the municipality and in the rink, you couldn't have, you couldn't have a, a firearm. I mean, and I'm sure there's a hundred stories like that, right? Yeah, it was it was really good times and uh, great people that that supported each other in the community extremely well, but also the the hockey and. Um, that was probably the most caring you could ever feel. And I mean, you'd be a part of that and, and, and how, how passionate they are about hockey and their program just makes you want to do it forever. So that's, that was a, that was a great time. Yeah. I got a couple more for you about your days at Alaska. Uh, was Tavis McMillan as well-dressed then as he is now? No, no chance. He, he, <laughs> he didn't have the money, right? More. Yeah, no, he has elevated his game. He used to be, he used to be a little bit more old school. Uh, and we would just show up, you know, no, now, now you can't touch that style. He's, he's changed a little bit. I'm going to have to remind him about that. Yeah, we, I may too, because I may end up getting him on here with Fred and I. He's a great guy, as you mentioned, yeah. and know him well, and I've gotten to know him well uh, at Denver too. And, and even when he took over as a head coach there uh, later in Dallas, of course, now, did he play, did Dallas, was he a player for you or was he already done? No, he was already done, but I did know him as, as an alumni. Okay. Um, so I did know him, but I, I never coached him. But uh, with Tavis, I got—I honestly, I owe—I owe Tavis a ton because, like I said, I, I 
I had an idea about on ice hockey, but at the time knew nothing about college hockey compliance, et cetera. And I really leaned on him to teach me everything about the ropes like that. And, and he was just great. And I think we had a pretty good time, but, but uh, he probably felt he was doing more than just one job. Yeah, I'm sure. And then last night doing a little reading and, and found a Fred, you may have talked with guy about this, but I'd love him to share it with the audience. You had an opportunity to talk with Ron Mason early in your tenure and, there was a quote that he had told you. And can you, can you yeah. share that and, and uh, enlighten the audience on that? Yeah, it was, I think it was the first year and, um, and we already were doing fairly well. Um, but Michigan state t- came to town and at that time they had a team. Man. I, yeah. mean, they had a team. I think, you know, it was really tough to get anywhere on the ice. And if you did, then you dealt with Ryan Miller. So, I mean, it right. was tough. And I remember, you know, the, the, the game, I think it must have been the Saturday night game, but I'm not positive. They beat us 3 nothing. And the thing was, after the game, I remember a bunch of fans were, wow, you only lost by three. Like, that's a great job. <laughs> but in reality, it was probably the worst drubbing I've ever taken as a coach. And the reason is we actually had one shot from the house. One. Like, it was just over. It, we were controlled so easily, I felt. And I just felt so dejected about, man, I'm like, how do you just, how did you just dominate? So I went up to him. And I was like, you know, coach, I got to ask you, like, what, how did you, you know, how did you do that? That was terrible. Like, how did you just control us so bad? He said, look, he goes, uh, and they had Sean Horkoff yeah. at the time. And I don't think they were, ju- I don't think he was just talking about Sean, but he was one of them. He was the captain. And, yeah. and he said, look, when your best players, are your best workers. He goes, then you're done. That's what he told me. And he probably said some other things as well, but that was the one thing that he was like, look, you Joe, once your best players are your best workers, then you're done. That's what he said. And, and so I think that probably fit. You watched his teams play. Obviously he's a great coach and he was really disciplined in what he did, but the, 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 the best players did it to a T and worked so hard. And I think that's why they're so, so successful. So from our staff at Fairbanks and on, I've never forgotten that. That's wow. awesome. Did you ever, did you ever get any advice from Red Berenson? Did he ever tell you anything? Yeah. You know what? I, I, that was one of my highlights of coaching is, is coaching against Red Berenson. And for a couple reasons is, is off the ice. He's such a cool gentleman. Like he is just such a cool guy. One of the, one of the greatest nights I think I've ever had. It was in Naples, Florida during coaches meetings and and the hotel I stayed, I didn't have, couldn't watch the NHL playoffs games. So I was running around trying to find, trying to find a TV to watch NHL games. And I went, stumbled upon in the basement of some other hotel down the, there was, there was a TV on. I was like, oh my God, it's in. So I run out and there's one chair and it was Red Berenson. And so we sat there in the basement watching an NHL playoff game and just listening to him talk. It was, it was great. But he's just such a gentleman. But on the ice, like after games, like he's a killer. Like, he mm-hmm. is a killer. I remember one game in Fairbanks, we actually beat them. And so after the game, we go to shake hands like you always do. <laughs> and so, you know, I reach out my hand and, and he grabs and shakes and good game, good game. And I go to turn away to walk on the ice and he pulls me back at him. He goes, enjoy it. And walked off. And I was like, oh, my God. That sounds so like Red. Red and so I loved him. Like the nicest gentleman off the ice, but man, no one wanted to win as bad as him. And I really, I just love competing against him. Yeah. That's awesome I, stuff. Freddie. I, I got to go back to, to Mun Ice Arena. And <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this. Rob Aller, Fox Sports Detroit at the time, now does the Tampa Bay Lightning game. And he, he, he was always thinking outside the box. And you guys were on a TV game, which was going back to Fairbanks the whole bit. And uh, Rob came up to me well before the game and said, hey, do you think we could put a microphone on uh, Fairbanks' goalie? And I was like, oh, yes, they can only say no. Oh, wow. And the guy made my pitch. I think the goalies were Lance Mays. Lance Mays, yeah, it was Lance. Lance yeah. And the guy says, sure, fine with me, but <laughs> let, let me ask Lance. You know what goalies are like. So no problem. And at that time, they had to wear those big packs, remember? That's a right. Black pack like that with a with a, a wire. Uh, yeah. You know. So away we go. Um, you know, ten minutes into the game. I no, maybe it must have been no, it must have been the second period. Great sound from the first period. Early in the second, there's a scramble around the net and Lance flies over and this battery pack comes loose and it's lying in the crease. Yeah. One of the Fairbanks defenseman thought it was the puck. Well, he yeah. fires it up. Oh, man. 
Yeah. And the, the, the real puck, the play transitions, Michigan's or Fairbanks is taken the other way, and the linesman's trying to catch up. He skates right over the wire. <laughs> Cuts it in half. There it goes. And end of transmission. You're yeah. Right? I do, and it was like no one was doing that at that time. It was sort of innovative. Yeah. I remember the 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 receptor or receiver was like it was square but black, and 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 if you don't re- honestly look, it looked just like a puck. And I remember watching that scramble and like get it, and then it slapped down the ice, and oh, that was hilarious. I I thought that was really good. Yeah, Mon Ice Arena. Yeah, that was fun. Good old Mon. So Fairbanks to to Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, were you thinking, well, if if Princeton was good enough for Einstein, uh, it's gonna be, it's, it's going to be good enough for me. Uh, you know, you, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, you, you were ready to move on. I would think. Well, it was. Uh, you know what? I got to tell you that it's not far off because Princeton is uh, obviously Princeton. And I have never known anything about it except that it's Princeton. And um, when that opportunity came available, I was just so intrigued with the university um, and never uh, had the opportunity to to be around anything like that. And um, it was something that just really intrigued me, Princeton University. Uh, I thought that was so cool. And uh, half of me, or probably 90% of me, thought there was no chance of getting a job. But, but if I could ever get an interview and get on campus and just look around and see where Einstein was in the whole bit, I thought that would be really cool. And so I did that, probably thinking not really that I had a chance of getting the job, or even if I got it, if I would leave. But then I got on campus, and I remember that's partly why I was going there. So I went early in the morning, a couple hours before my interview started, just to look around. And the campus is I mean, unbelievable, like just unbelievable. And obviously you can imagine all the history that is there. I got a chance to look around and go in buildings and talk to different people. They had no idea who I was, but just about the history of Princeton and went on what went on in the different buildings. I mean, it's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's an amazing, amazing place. And, um, and it just came about that we got fortunate enough that we were offered the job and it just seemed like a really cool challenge that I, I would never, ever have the opportunity to, to be a part of anything like that. So we did it. And obviously had success. I, I always go back to your quote, and I forget when it was. You said, you know, anywhere else I've been coaching, roller hockey, West Coast League, Alaska, I always thought, you know, I was probably one of the smartest guys in the room. <laughs> this guy's in the dressing room. <laughs> and guy's quote was, I get to Princeton. I, I might have been the least smart guy in the room. Yeah. To use the word dumb. Uh, some some really high achieving intellectual players, right? Amazing, amazing, and that's absolutely the truth. I was absolutely the least smart guy in the locker room, and everybody knew it, so it was cool. No one, no one had any questions about that. That was that was true. But I tell you what, those guys are amazing, and and how hard how hard they have to work. At, uh, at academics and how the, the things they did were unbelievable. Guys, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Westgarth's brother, Brett, was there. And his, his senior thesis, he built a motorcycle from scratch, like completely from scratch, not like, a, like completely. Every part he went and got somewhere. And get, that was his project. And he remember he took me a ride on it after he finished it for his thesis. I'm like, you're just amazing. It's amazing people. And um, one really cool thing, well, there's a lot of cool things, but one was Mike Moore, who you might remember. He played for the San Jose Sharks. He was captain at, at, at Princeton when we won the, the ECACs. And one of the things that was so cool is, is he was also a volunteer fireman. This gives you the idea of the type of guys that, that are there. He was a volunteer fireman. And, and what happened is there was a fire in one of the labs, one of the science labs that, that, uh, that had a fire. So anyway, a professor the next day was called and said, you, you had a fire uh, in your lab and you got to come and check out all the damage. So he goes in and he looks around and they were able to clean up the fire, but all the computers were all back in working order. And yet the fire was, was around there. So he knew they had to take the computers out, clean up the stuff. And, and, the, but the computers were back. And he was like, how, did, how, how could you possibly do this? How, like who came in here before me? And they were like, oh, no, it's just, you know, firemen. And he goes, well, that's the, it can't be true. Like, all these computers are perfect. They're all working. They're all set up. They're, this, this can't be. But it was Mike Moore, after he put out the fire, he stayed there, and he set everything back up and connected and started the way 
that it was. And, and the professor was like, that's impossible. Like no one can do this. And that, that was Mike Moore. Those guys like that. It was just incredible. Fred, I think I remember him, guy telling us that story. Of course, the only guy missing from the trio when you took your team at Princeton to the regionals in 08 is Richie. And you, I, I think I remember that. I remember uh, Zane Kalemba, Lee yeah. Jubinville. And here's, here's to add to the smartness. Fred, you'll probably remember this. Have you spoken to Landis Stankovich recently? And what is he doing? Absolutely. You know what? He is one of my all-time favorite players ever. Um, this guy, oh man, is he a special human being? He 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 scored the the championship winning goal for for Princeton, so that pretty good. You could stop yeah. there, and you'd be one yeah, of my yeah. top ready. Yeah. But he also that year won a road scholarship to Oxford, which is incredible. He was Princeton's top student, Princeton's top student, not not student athlete. He was Princeton's top student. I mean, just think about that. This guy is just so spectacular. He went on to do some really cool things after Oxford and was a part of, I know there was a company that, I mean, that all there, he was a consultant and he, and I asked him all about it. He goes, well, all our, our clients, I said, who, who are your clients? He goes, well, you know, big corporations, small countries, those are the clients. He goes, but they're all anonymous. He goes, so basically it was a consulting company for big, big companies, small countries that needed that needed problem solving. That's what he was doing. And then his dad had a uh, farm equipment business back in Alberta that, that he wanted to expand. So Landis went and helped him out to really expand this business, which I guess is doing extremely well. So he is one of the most amazing human beings that, you, that you'll ever meet. I'll, I'll never forget that. And I, at the time, he was, I'd have to look it up, but at the time he was the first Canadian in college hockey to, to get a Rhodes Scholar. I don't know if he still is, but at the time he was. Yeah, it's amazing. What a guy. I remember when he was doing his uh, senior thesis, um, he was, he, he pulled, the guys told me he pulled five all-nighters in seven days. And I was like, Landis, that's no good. He goes, no, no problem. Every morning I, I check myself into the infirmary and I take my vitals. So he would have, like, that's, who would think wow. of that? So he knew, you know, he, he was pulling, he had five all-nighters in seven days, but he would make sure that he had, you know, all his vitals were fine. I mean, a different level. So, yep. uh, another Princeton question. So how does a, a revered institution that spawns uh, Kobe Baker and, you know, also also give rise to two of the toughest guys in the NFL at the time and in, in yeah. Westgarth and George Barrows. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. I mean, and they are not, I mean, Mike Moore was super tough. Daryl Powell played with the Flyers were super, was super yeah. tough. Um, man, I'm forget. Oh, Kyle Hagel might be the toughest of them all. And there, I mean, they, we had some unbelievably tough guys. And uh, so George actually graduated the year that I got there. And I remember him just what an unbelievably humble, polite young man. Like he was so polite and so respectful. I mean, and he always was like that. Obviously, he's brilliant. But that was what I, what I remember about him. And um, with Kevin, Kevin's brilliant. Brilliant guy. Absolutely brilliant. Um, it, and his brother is as well. They're just, they're at a different, they're so smart. Um, but really cool guy too. And, I tell you what, he could shoot the puck. Like, uh, I mean, he had a few big time, big time weekends for us. But he was also a guy. You just had, you just had the knowledge. And you just sort of looked at and knew that man. He's the type of guy that if things go south, boy, you just get behind him. He just obviously he's a big, 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 strong man with a big grin and a, as big a personality. And uh, it's amazing. I don't know why Princeton do, has done it, but they they've put some amazingly tough guys out. It's it's incredible. Well, obviously, it was uh, an exhaustive search uh, by Penn State when when uh, they opted to to start hockey with uh, uh, the endowment from uh, Terry Pagula. How was that process from your end? Uh, you must know there are dozens and dozens of applicants. Yeah, you know that was a. It was just the 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 potential uh, of the Big Ten and uh, and Terry Pagula is involved in Penn State. I knew nothing, obviously about the university but I knew all about their fans you know uh, and, and I don't know much about college football either but I knew about Penn State football and Penn State fans um, and that was always been really intriguing to me um, just 
how much support they have for the athletic programs was amazing. And then obviously just the thought of the possibility of the Big Ten and having Michigan and Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan State, Ohio State, all in the same conference was was really quite appealing, obviously. And and I had a chance in the process to meet Terry Pagula and um and boy, if you were you if you weren't sold before, he sure did it. You know, just just the type of man he is and just such a great hockey guy. The thing about him, you, you forget who he is in two minutes. He's just he's got that way about him that he just he's just a great hockey guy. He just loves hockey, he loves talking to hockey and re- really in two minutes you totally forget that, that who he is and it's just like you're talking to one of your hockey buddies and and I tell you what though the the vision that that Mr. Bagula and the university have for the program was uh, pretty exciting and leaving Princeton was brutal because of the guys that we just talked there's so many I only mention a few but all of them are just so special and um uh, mean meant so much and that was that was actually a lot harder than I ever thought but uh but very exciting and the opportunity to go join team Pagula and Penn State was uh was pretty cool you you, you had to coach the the club team a year was yeah that, it's great was that refreshing as refreshing as, oh. as you've had it was great. It was so much fun. And they were pumped. I mean, as you can imagine, it was a team of guys that were just pumped to, you know, this, this program was going D1. And we, we kept players from that club team for at least three years um, on. And they were great guys. And, and they shared the excitement of not only the, the university and Mr. Pagula and our staff, but, you know, everybody was just so excited to get this going. It was such a fun year. I mean, such a fun year. And you know, one of the things we said right from the start is, we, is, is, look, we don't care about wins and losses, but we greatly care about every single standard, cultural standard that you're going to set is extremely important. And, and even though they did extremely well, obviously, in wins and losses, but it was, it was those standards as far as the culture and the foundation goes that, was, that we said right from the start, that's what we, this is all about. So if you don't buy into that, you're not going to be here. But if you buy into that, that's what we really are going to deem successful, and they did an unbelievable job of that. So you you go you you left one of the most iconic arenas and buildings in sport, in my opinion. I had the pleasure to do okay. one game when you were yeah. there. Uh, yeah. I think it was Cornell. You guys played. Richie and I were in the yeah. end zone, calling yeah. the game. And what a building! And then yeah. so take us fast forward to the first time you guys are a varsity team and you walk out into this brand new building that you have at Penn state. What was that like? That whole week leading up to it was stressful, exciting, heart pumping because there was so much to do from every aspect, getting the team ready, getting the building ready. I mean, we we're painting on, I think the game was Friday. We we're painting Thursday. Like, I mean, it was, they were just, it was, everything was ramped up to get this done. And everybody talked about, you know, the Penn State fans and what the student section is going to be like, what the atmosphere in the building is going to be like. And everybody had expectations with that, but no one, no one really could tell you what it was going to be like. So, so before the game, everybody's amped up. And then Terry Pagula walked in our locker room. We didn't know, we didn't know this was coming. He walked in and gave a speech to the guys, what was important to him and, and my goodness, like, I mean, it, it was like, you could feel the hair, like, this is a big deal. This is, this is huge. And everybody was just, just chewing nails, ready to go. And we get out and for the first time, you know, you look and you see the student section jam the students, the, the, the pitch is as steep as it, as you can get. And the place winds going nuts as we were just, just, just skating out on the ice the place went nuts. And it was so loud and it was, an unbelievable experience that entire evening you know your heart's pumping and uh fans are going nuts and they're loving it and i mean obviously we we score a goal and the place erupts even you know you feel literally you feel like the thing like it's gonna blow up and uh it was unbelievable and i don't think our hearts start pounding for hours after the game i know uh going back to, to Fairbanks, nobody, there are no coach. I know a, co- a lot of coaches have fun with their players. Nobody seems to have as much fun or enjoy being around the players as you do. And, and, I, and I'm sure that, you know, you've had your share of guys show up out of shape and miss curfew and have academic problems. But where, where did you kind of, uh, how did you get imbued with that? 
have fun, but also separate that business and hockey business and work is one thing, but you still have to enjoy yourself. Well, so my wife would tell you that's that, that I just had that with the kids. And, and, and so she would probably speak about it similarly, but not in as much of an adm admiration type of way, but it all came from my dad. I mean, he was a t teacher for 40 years. And, uh, and I remember I'd meet, you know, years later, I'd, I'd be in Edmonton and I'd meet someone who knew my last name was Gadowski. And they're like, oh, are you, are you at all related to Orson Gadowski? He was my favorite teacher. It was so much fun. I hear that all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. And he was the same way as at home. Like if there was, you know, dishes to be done or, or lawn to be mowed or sidewalk. I mean, you had a competition. Whoever lost went and did it. Like that's how it was. And, and you just had a lot of fun doing what you have to do and uh i don't know it's sort of the way i was brought up and the way um i thought was really enjoyable way of doing things and we just sort of that's the way it sort of carries over so i mean it's uh i think you need guys that really like to compete and enjoy competing but if you have guys like that then um you know then i think it goes really well and, and you know this year you have players i mean go down the line but a lot has been talked about like evan barrett and 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 Alex Limoges and, and Liam Folks and how they were so good. And, and really, I think the biggest thing about them is they just love competing. Like they, they would work as hard as anybody in practice, but it sure didn't look like work. I mean, they'd be high-fiving each other and having fun and hooting and hollering. I mean, they're sweating and they stay out longer, they, they, but they don't, you can't call it work. They just had a blast. And I don't mind, I think that was a good way to be. I like that culture. Yeah. You had uh, obviously some Penn State players are now graduating to the highest level. I think, you know, Casey Bailey was the first uh, Penn State player to score a goal in the NHL. But this, this current crop with, you know, Evan Barrett and Cole Holtz, could that be the, the next step in the evolution? You're not going to have just players in the NHL. You're going to have some guys who are going to be impact players in the NHL and maybe be there a long time. Well, I think so. And there's certainly a lot of others. Um, right. And, and not just them, but you can go down uh, Brandon Byro, Nate Sassis, Liam Folks, as I talked about. Peyton Jones is another one. Uh, we have uh, a lot of, I hope, you know, obviously our two Russians, Dennis and Nikita Pavelchev, are two draft choices that have a good chance as well. So and I don't mean to miss anybody, but th this class was very special. They won the champ, they won the, uh, the Big Ten Championship as freshmen, and they all continue to get better. But I, I think you're right. I think uh, the guys from this class are possibly going to be the guys that, that really get a stronghold in NHL and stay for a long time. And I hope so. That's, that's part of the vision of Mr. Pagula and everybody in Penn State is to, uh, to have uh, alumni at the highest level. And, and I, I think this is a, is a class that's probably going to start that. It's good to hear. And uh, so take us back to when, it all, when the season ended for you guys. I mean, you, what, just it's tough for everybody. Everyone's got a story. What was the story yeah. from Penn State when you had to, had to bring your team together and tell them? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, obviously, there's a lot bigger things going on in the world than, than, than hockey or Penn State hockey, that's for sure. Uh, but our own little story, was it, was it was tough because this is a group that really, I mean, they, this, we talked a little bit about the senior class as well as others, Cole Holtz and Evan Barrett aren't even seniors. Um, but they were really hungry to do something, really hungry. And, um, and really, the last nine games, they only lost once. And we actually had a couple key injuries. The guys starting to get, we were starting to get healthy. So we were playing our best hockey of the year for sure. Um, we were getting healthy. Um, we just, we had it, we had a series against Minnesota where we had to get a win, at least a win and a tie to give us a chance of winning the Big Ten regular season. And that's exactly what we did. And both games were in dramatic fashion. Alex Lamoe scores, scores in overtime on Friday night. And then uh, Kevin Wall, Nikita Pavlichev scored a great goal, uh, pass from Dylan Grattan. He scores a great goal to tie, tie the game up. 31 seconds, uh, Kevin Wall scores the winner, again, from Nikita. And, uh, and, we, and we knew we had a chance to win the Big Ten regular season, which we've never done before. And as it turned out, we had to buy it the next weekend. But as it turned out, that's exactly what happened. So best season we have ever had starting to get healthy we even get another a buy so we can even you know everything was falling for us and, and you know the regionals which we knew we were already going to be a part of were, was allentown just a couple hours down the road from penn state and uh boy the support that penn staters get there is incredible 
Uh, so everything was sort of set and guys were really, really, really hungry to make it happen. And, and then we were told that, uh, it's over. And, um, it was tough. I, I, you know, we sort of told the team and everybody's sort of digesting it, but I remember meeting with, you know, I just wanted to meet with some of the seniors just for a couple minutes. I said, I, I can't believe how emotional it was meeting those guys, knowing that they were, it was over and how much they had to give. And I remember, you know, when we talked to the team, I remember Nate to see sitting in the front row and everybody was just sort of looking at it, you know, and sort of being, you know, understanding and you can see them accepting what's going on and, and he was just scowling like he was mad like just mad that he wouldn't get the opportunity to to, to go try win this whole thing and 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 that was so that's what I remember about that and ESPN was sending that unbelievable broadcast crew to Allentown <laughs> um, guy we had Mark Crawford one of your former coaches on last week and you know there, there's a family from from Ontario I think uh five five sons played pro hockey three in the NHL the sixth son uh was an Olympic uh snowboarder uh, uh, Olympic uh, bobsledder wow. and you know hockey has given uh so much to so many people I know you would include yourself in that category and and sometimes it's it's great to reflect back on on some humble beginnings. And I know a story that might encapsulate that for you is uh, the hockey stick that you wanted for Christmas one time. Can you, can you tell us that one one more time? Well, it's funny. I, you know, when you, when you listen to, to, to young youth hockey players now about their sticks and what they get, I remember, yeah, it, it was, a, I remember um, I, I want it for my birthday, which was in, in, in summer, like just before the start of the, of the hockey season. Um, we were at, we were at United Cycle, which was where you got your skate sharpened, where you bought your stuff. In fact, great story. Ken Hitchcock worked there at the time. But anyway, I remember being there and, uh, I asked my dad if I could get this hockey. I loved Guy Lafleur at the time. I was pretty young and I loved Guy Lafleur. And it was, uh, a Sherwood 5030. You might remember these sticks. Sherwood 5030 Grolet. What's the P that? The PMP. That's the one. Exactly. Guy Lafleur. And I was like, dad. Oh, I was like, Dad, I need this. I want. He was like, No way, like no way. I said, Dad, please, from where can I please get? And he looked at. It, he was like, Okay, but this stick costs nine dollars and ninety five cents. So if you get it, that's the last stick you get all year. So that's I remember that story. Now, obviously, you tell the way kids, you know, today with sticks, they just don't understand that part of it. Wow, hmm. now it's like two hundred nine dollars. <laughs> that's right yeah. that's the cheap end that's yeah. the cheap end and everyone needs four yeah no kidding no kidding well uh fred how do you feel we uh we good i think so it's it's always it's always great talking to guy and he's always so yeah accommodating with us with us broadcasters and uh we hope we see you back on the ice soon and, and we can be back uh, broadcasting as well yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. It's nice. Thanks for having me. I, I feel bad. I feel a little uh, conscious. I don't have it as nice. You guys have great backdrops. I'm just here in the basement. And I gotta, if I'm going to do this again, i got to up my game a little bit. <laughs> it's all good. We appreciate you doing it. It's great to see you again. It's been a long time since I've seen you, so it's great to see you. And uh, continued success to your Penn State program, Guy. We appreciate you joining us. Hey, thank you very much, guys. You have a great day. Be safe. Thank you. Guy Godowski, head coach of Penn State, joining us here on this edition of No Holding Back for Fred Pletch, Ben Holden. We'll see you next time for an all-new edition.